Solving Spectroscopy Problems. This webcast will hopefully give you some insights into how to take different types of spectra and use that spectra to determine the structure of an unknown compound. You start by first organizing your data. This means making use of tables. You will be dealing with different types of spectra that give you different types of information. And being able to organize the data in a way that makes sense will be crucial to success. Once you have the data organized and you begin interpreting it, you must remember that each piece of your data must be consistent with all of the other data at your disposal. For example, if you see a carbonyl stretch in your infrared spectrum, you must also see a carbonyl signal in your carbon-13 spectrum. Remember, solving spectroscopy problems is very much like diagnosing a medical condition. You are taking disparate pieces of information and must come to a conclusion that is consistent with all of those pieces of information. Fortunately, some of the data you collect will be redundant. What this means is often, there is no one correct way to solve a spectroscopy problem. It is entirely possible you can come to the same conclusion as the person next to you using a different logical route, where both routes are equally valid. In a typical spectroscopy problem, you will be provided the molecular formula for the unknown molecule, in this case C5H10O, and a series of spectra. In this case, I have an IR spectra in the upper left, a carbon-13 NMR spectra in the upper right, and a proton NMR spectra at the bottom. This particular problem does not include a mass spectra, but you can imagine also being given mass spectra to interpret as well. This one slide contains a huge amount of information, so how do you begin trying to interpret these spectra and come up with an unknown structure? Well, you don't look at all of it all at once. To start with, let's look at the molecular formula and the infrared spectrum. The molecular formula allows us to calculate the degrees of unsaturation for the compound. Let's remember that degrees of unsaturation is equal to 2 times the number of carbons, plus 2, minus the number of hydrogens, plus the number of nitrogen atoms, minus the number of halogen atoms, all over 2. If we plug in our values, we see that we have 2 times 5, plus 2, minus 10, all over 2. Because we have no nitrogen atoms, and we have no halogen atoms. Do some arithmetic, we see that we have 2 over 2, or 1 degree of unsaturation. That means that we have 1 pi bond or 1 ring. Now let us begin interpreting the IR spectrum. Let us go through the regions in the IR spectrum as you were taught in the IR spectroscopy webcast. First, we know that anything in the fingerprint region is not to be interpreted, so we can ignore everything on the right side there. Now we start going to higher wave numbers. As we go from right to left, the first region we would encounter would be the carbon-carbon double bond region, around 1650 wave numbers. Do we see any stretches around 1650? No, we don't. So we do not have any carbon-carbon double bonds. The next region is for carbonyls at around 1700 wave numbers. Do we see a stretch at around 1700 wave numbers? Indeed, we do. We have a carbonyl stretch at around 1700 wave numbers. Let's start by making a table. Where the left side is the type of bond and the right side is the wave number. Let's begin organizing our information. The next region would be at roughly 2200, which is where we would find any carbon-carbon triple bonds. Do I see any carbon-carbon triple bond stretches? No, I don't. So we probably don't have a carbon-carbon triple bond. Now let's look at 3000 wave numbers. At 3000, we would see CH stretches. Do we see any stretches here? Yes, we do. If I draw a line from 3000, we see that all of my CH stretches are below 3000. 
Therefore, all of my CH bonds in this molecule have carbons that are sp3 hybridized. Because I see nothing above 3000, I have no sp2 hybridized CH bonds or sp hybridized CH bonds. That's pretty useful information to know. Finally, let's look in the 3500 area. Do we see any major stretches here? Some of you may be thinking, yeah, we see this here. And because this lump is so small, that's probably an NH bond. Here is where you need to be careful. In this particular spectrum, this blob doesn't actually correspond to anything in our molecule. That blob corresponds to residual water in our sample. How would you as a student know that? You would know that by the shape and the size. Remember, alcohols tend to be very broad and very tall clearly not an OH. It is very small, which is consistent with what you have seen for NHs. However, the shape of this blob is not consistent with the NHs you have seen. The NH stretches you have seen have been either relatively short but broad two-peak signals or moderately strong single-peak signals. That's how I know this does not belong to my molecule and is likely just residual water. And there we go. We have finished our analysis of the infrared spectrum. I know that I have a carbonyl somewhere in my molecule, and all of my CH bonds are sp3 hybridized carbon CH bonds. It doesn't sound like much, but that gives us actually a great deal. For example, remember how we had only one degree of unsaturation? And that degrees of unsaturation correspond to either pi bonds or rings? We now know that this one degree of unsaturation corresponds to the carbonyl in our molecule. We know we have a carbonyl because we have a stretch that tells us we do. Carbonyls contain a pi bond, therefore the carbonyl is the source of our one degree of unsaturation. We now know that there are no rings in our molecule because we have no degrees of unsaturation left, and we have no other pi bonds in the molecule. We have done a very quick analysis here, but we've learned a great deal from this very short analysis. Okay, so far we have calculated our degrees of unsaturation, which is a value of one, and recorded that in our tables. In the IR spectrum, we have filled a table containing the major stretches in the IR spectrum. Now let's move on to interpreting the carbon-13 NMR. Before we start, let us note that we have three peaks here at roughly 77 ppm. Remember, that corresponds to chloroform, the NMR solvent, and so it is not part of our molecule. Now let's start our interpretation. First, we're going to label these carbon signals. In this course, for consistency, we're going to label carbon signals using numbers from left to right. So this signal on the left is 1, and we go from left to right. We simply label those 2, 3, and 4. Let's go ahead and start making a table. One, two. Three, four, and now let's record the chemical shift of each of these signals. If we look at carbon one, that's between 210 and 220. That's probably about 213. Doesn't have to be exact. Let's remember that the units for this column are ppm. Now let's look at carbon two. That looks to be, oh, 42 ppm. Carbon 3 appears to be 27 ppm. And carbon 4, let's say 18 ppm. And that's it. That is the entire analysis of our carbon 13 spectrum. What has this analysis told us? Remember that a carbon 13 NMR tells us two things it tells us the number of equivalent sets of carbons, and it gives us some information about the types of carbons present and or the presence of functional groups. Let's look at the number of signals we have. One, two, three, four. Now let's compare that number to the number of carbons in our molecular formula. Five. I have five carbons in my molecular formula, but only four signals in the carbon NMR. How is that possible? It's possible because of symmetry. Remember, each signal corresponds to a set of equivalent carbon atoms. That means one of these signals, 1, 2, 3, or 4, must contain 
two carbon atoms. Which one is it? In a proton NMR, we would know via integration. Unfortunately, carbon-13 NMR does not integrate well. Now let's look at these chemical shifts. I have a signal at 213 ppm. I know that carbonyl carbons show up in that range. That means I have a carbonyl somewhere in my molecule. And that's good, because this is consistent with our conclusions from the IR spectrum analysis. We had a carbonyl stretch in the IR spectrum. We have a carbon-13 signal in the carbon-13 NMR. Our data is consistent. What about these other chemical shifts? 42, 27, 18. Those are pretty far upfield. That means we probably don't have any strong electron withdrawing groups in the molecule. That being said, signals 2 and 3 are slightly deshielded. Do we know of any electron withdrawing groups that could be deshielding 2 and 3? Sure we do. The carbonyl. This tells me that carbons 2 and 3 are probably close to the carbonyl, maybe even directly attached to it. I don't know that for certain, but given the information we currently possess, that's not a bad guess. Okay, so we finished analyzing the carbon-13 spectrum. We now take this information, put it into our table if we've not already done so, and then we begin analyzing the proton NMR spectrum. Interpreting the proton NMR spectrum will likely be the most time-consuming portion of any spectroscopy problem. This is because you can pull out more information from a proton NMR spectrum than you can from the other types of spectrum given to you. Let us begin by labeling our proton NMR signals. In this course, for consistency, we are going to label proton signals using letters starting with A from left to right. Now that that's done, let's begin building our table. What pieces of information can we pull out of an NMR spectrum? Like with the carbon, you can pull out chemical shift. Unlike the carbon, we can pull out integration and multiplicity and coupling constants, J values. Let's go ahead and begin filling in these values by first looking at the chemical shifts of our signals. If I look at signal A, it turns out I have a zoomed in picture of the signal A and I can see that the middle of the signal is at about 2.55 ppm. If we look at signal B next, that looks to be at about 2.05. If we look at signal C, the middle looks to be at about 1.16 ppm. Great. Chemical shift is done. Now let's move on to integration. Look at these values down below. Signal A has an integration of 1. Signal B has an integration that rounds to 3, because 3 is the closest integer. And signal C has an integration of 6, because 6 is the closest integer. Okay, we're done there as well. Now let's move on to multiplicity. How many peaks does signal A have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That makes signal A a septet. Which is sept for short. Look at signal B. I see only one peak, therefore that's a singlet, S for short. And then finally for signal C, we have two peaks, therefore that's a doublet, D for short. Now let's look at our J values. Let's look at signal B. Signal B has no splitting, therefore signal B has no coupling constant, no J value. A and C, however, do have splitting, therefore they must have a coupling constant, a J value. Let's look at signal A first. If I looked in at the zoomed area for signal A, I'm going to pick the two leftmost peaks. I don't have to, you can pick any two adjacent peaks, but I'm going to pick these left two. I'm not going to show the arithmetic here, but if I take the difference in chemical shift between these two peaks and multiply it by the strength of the spectrometer, 500 megahertz, the value I get is 6.4 hertz. If I do the same arithmetic for the doublet on the right, I get 6.4 hertz. Isn't that interesting? And there we go. We have pulled out all of the information we can from this proton NMR spectrum. We see that we have three sets of equivalent protons 
And we've listed the chemical shifts of those signals, the integration of those signals, the multiplicity of those signals, and the coupling constants of those signals. We're not going to do a full analysis here, but what are some quick things we can see from this data? From the chemical shifts of our protons, we see that all of our protons are relatively far upfield. That means there are no strong electron withdrawing groups in our molecule. This is consistent with the carbon NMR data. If we look at the integrations, we see that we have integrations of 1, 3, and 6. We know that carbons cannot have more than 4 bonds. How can we have an integration of 6? To get an integration of 6, you must have protons on different carbons that are chemically equivalent. Another indication of symmetry. We'll talk more about multiplicity on the next slide, but before we leave, we should look at the coupling constants. Signal A and C have the same coupling constant. Therefore, they must be splitting each other. Therefore, they must be adjacent to each other. We have now finished interpreting our proton NMR spectrum. We have taken the information from the spectrum and organized it into a table. Now let's see if we can take all the information we possess and turn it into a molecular structure. This slide contains all of the data tables that we have created so far in this spectroscopy analysis. We have our molecular formula and the associated degrees of unsaturation. We have the infrared stretches that we identified in the infrared spectrum. We have the chemical shifts of the carbon-13 signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. We have the data from the proton NMR spectrum analysis that we just completed. How can we take these disparate pieces of information and combine them into a molecular structure? I'm going to show you one way to parse this data. There are likely different ways you can analyze this data and come to the same conclusion. Don't think that you have to solve these types of problems the same way I am about to. I'm simply giving a demonstration of how I solve these types of problems. First, I know that I have a carbonyl. I know that this carbonyl takes care of our one degree of unsaturation. I also know that this carbonyl contains our only electronegative atom. Therefore, this carbonyl is the only electron withdrawing group in the molecule. Because the carbonyl is the only electron withdrawing group in this molecule, the signals that are downfield in the proton and carbon spectra must be attached to this carbonyl. If you look specifically at the protons, we see that signal A and B both have relatively downfield chemical shifts. That means they are most likely adjacent to this carbonyl. Okay, if we want to connect A and B to the carbonyl, we have to know what A and B correspond to. Are they methines? Are they methylenes? Are they methyls? How can we figure out what they are? Let's look at the other information we possess. We see that signal B is a singlet with an integration of 3. The integration of 3 tells me that B is probably a methyl. The fact that it is a singlet tells me that this methyl is not adjacent to any other protons. This is a good indication that the methyl is probably directly connected to the carbonyl. Does all of our data support this? We have a signal that is probably a methyl because it has an integration of 3. It's a singlet, therefore it is not adjacent to any protons, and it is relatively far downfield meaning it is probably next to our electron withdrawing carbonyl. And that all matches this proposed partial structure. Let's look at signal A. Signal A has an integration of 1 and is a septet. An integration of 1 tells me that it is probably a methine, which means it is connected to three things. Because the chemical shift of A is so far downfield, it is probably connected to the carbonyl. Doesn't tell us what else the methine is connected to. What are our options? The protons that are connected to signal C are the only ones left. Let's look at what types of protons those are. 
we see that we have an integration of 6. The multiplicity of that signal was a doublet. The integration of 6 tells me that this is probably 2 methyl groups. Because 2 times 3 would be 6. This could be 3 methylenes. However, if we look at my partial structure, I've used 3 carbons out of the 5 available. That means there are only 2 carbons left. Therefore, this has to be 2 methyl groups and not 3 methylenes. If I attach those methyl groups to the methine, does all of my data make sense? Signal C is an integration of 6 that appears as a doublet. Would these protons that I have labeled in green be chemically equivalent? Yes, they would, and would integrate the 6. Would they appear as a doublet? Yes, they would. These protons are adjacent to only one proton, therefore they would appear as a doublet. Does the coupling constant make sense? C has the coupling constant of 6.4, therefore the coupling constant for this methine, which is signal A, should also be 6.4. And it is. A and C must be adjacent to each other because they have the same J value. And indeed, they are adjacent to each other in this proposed structure. Does the chemical shift for C make sense? I have a chemical shift of about 1. That means it's far away from any electron withdrawing groups. And indeed, these methyls are far away from our electron withdrawing carbonyl. So the data for signal C matches our proposed structure. Let's go back and make sure it also matches the data for A and B. In our proposed structure, signal B belongs to this methyl all on its own, and we've already shown how all of this data matches its proposed location. Let's look at signal A. For signal A, we've already talked about how the chemical shift matches, and the integration matches, and the coupling constant matches. What about the multiplicity? Signal A, our methine, is adjacent to six protons. Therefore, it should appear as a septet. Does it? Yes, it does. This proposed structure is consistent with all of our proton NMR data. It has only one degree of unsaturation, therefore it matches our degrees of unsaturation value. The functional groups present in our proposed structure match the information we got from the infrared spectrum. We have a carbonyl, and all of our CH bonds contain sp3 hybridized carbons. What about the carbon NMR data? We have one carbonyl carbon, that's present in our proposed structure, that's great. And we have three other carbon signals, bringing us to four carbon signals total. Does this proposed structure give us four carbon signals? Yes. This methyl would produce its own signal, the carbonyl would produce its own signal, the methine would produce its own signal, and these two methyls at the end because they are chemically equivalent, would also produce their own signal. That is four carbon signals we should see, and four carbon signals in the carbon-13 NMR. Therefore, I am confident in stating that this molecular structure is our unknown structure. Hopefully, this demonstration of how to solve a spectroscopy problem was helpful. In this demonstration, I showed how to use each of these disparate pieces of data to come up with a proposed chemical structure. I showed how each data was useful for determining something in particular about the chemical structure, and how various pieces of data corroborated each other. For example, the carbonyl stretch in the infrared spectrum was corroborated by the carbonyl signal in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Hopefully, solving spectroscopy problems is now less intimidating. Don't be afraid of spectroscopy problem. Just ensure that you organize your data effectively. You saw how by taking all this information and putting them into tables, I was able to see patterns and connections within data sets and between data sets. How to effectively use this information will come with practice and with experience. But it always starts with proper organization of the data from the spectra. I would not be surprised if during this webcast, some of you saw certain connections before I spoke about them.
There is no one way to work through a spectroscopy problem. In my case, I started with the degrees of unsaturation, went to the infrared spectrum, and then briefly talked about the carbon NMR before moving on to the proton NMR data. Instead, you could have started from the proton NMR and then worked your way through these other types of data. So long as your final conclusion is supported by all of your data, you are doing well.